There is only one final transmission from Titan after this. 9.44 a.m. Polar Prince. We are talking it over with the engineer. Stand by. 9.45 a.m. Polar Prince. Depth and status, please. What's the wattage on upwards thrust? Titan. Reading red on A power bus. I switch to B. At 3475 meters. More sounds aft. Welcome to another episode of Working Class with Attorney Ryan, where I cover the most important cases in employment law. Some of them are funny, some of them are outrageous, some of them, like this one today, downright chilling. Chills. Now, this episode was released in July of 2023. So for future listeners, just to paint the scene, a few weeks ago, the Ocean Gate Exploration Company sent five passengers, including its CEO, Stockton Rush, on a deep sea voyage to explore the ruins of the Titanic. Like the Titanic, these would-be adventurers sought to explore, the Titan sub was doomed. I will describe what happened in detail shortly, but first, what if I told you that OceanGate's own employees predicted this disaster long before it happened? What if I told you that five years before the wreckage of their sub was scraped off the ocean floor, at least two employees warned Stockton Rush that it was only a matter of time before he and his passengers would die on this vessel? The warnings were ignored. The employees were ostracized, bullied, and even sued into silence. This is a story about two brave whistleblowers, a CEO blinded by his own ambition, and a 2018 lawsuit which predicted the events of 2023 with chilling accuracy. For today's episode, I have emails which very few people outside of the Ocean Gate Company have read. These emails are very scary to read with hindsight. I also have an unverified transcript, which appears to be the final messages of the Titan sub before it was crushed. Now, although the transcript is unverified, I personally believe it's authentic, and I will explain why I believe that during the show. But before we go any further, I have some disclaimers, and they are important. This episode contains descriptions of one of the most gruesome ways a human being can die. It is scary, not going to sugarcoat it, and it involves severe claustrophobic situations. So if this is going to be unbearable for you, no hate, please enjoy another episode of the show. But if you are down for this, come along. Our story starts in June 18th of 2023 on a clear day in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The exploration vessel Polar Prince sailed across the vast blue waters of the Atlantic. Aboard the Polar Prince was ocean explorer Stockton Rush. Stockton was the CEO of OceanGate, a company specializing in recreational deep sea adventures. Stockton saw himself as a modern Jacques Cousteau, bravely exploring lost shipwrecks, deep sea ecosystems, and unseen species far below the surface. On this day's voyage, Stockton was going to a familiar place, the resting place of the Titanic. Back in 1912, 1,517 passengers drowned on these very waters. Many of these people were never recovered, their bodies entombed in the Titanic, 3,800 meters down on the ocean floor. Stockton intended to explore the ruins in an experimental vessel, something he built, called the Titan Submersible. A brash and charismatic person, Stockton had told friends that he wanted to be the Elon Musk of the ocean, and his personal heroes included the types of General MacArthur. He had also said that he wanted to be remembered for the rules he broke. Stockton did get his wish. The Titan had been down to the Titanic at least three times already. Although the crew returned home during those prior dives, a long list of warning signs was already building. Rob McCallum, a deep-sea submersible expert and former advisor to OceanGate, sent an email to Stockton way back in March of 2018. In that email, Rob warned Stockton that OceanGate was using a, quote, prototype, unclassed technology in a very hostile place. He's referring to the Titan sub. In the email exchange, years before Stockton was crushed to death by his own sub, Rob McCallum warned, quote, 
I think you are potentially placing yourself and your clients in a dangerous dynamic. Ironically, in your race to the Titanic, you are mirroring that famous catch cry, she is unsinkable. Having dived the Titanic and having stood in a coroner's court as a technical expert, it would be remiss of me not to bring this to your attention. Blinded by ambition, Stockton ignored the warning. His email in this exchange reads, quote, Since Guillermo and I started OceanGate, we have heard the baseless cries of, you are going to kill someone way too often. I take this as a serious, personal insult. Holy shit. This was hard for me to read, folks. Rob knew what was going to happen. He knew it, and he tried to warn this guy. But Stockton had no patience for naysayers on his expeditions. And Rob wasn't the only person who knew something was wrong here. A few months after Rob McCallum's warnings, another employee named David Lockridge implored Stockton to reconsider his use of the Titan sub. Here's the gist of David Lockridge's concerns. Now, I'm going to go through this, and at the end of it, you're going to be a materials expert. Let's go. For starters... The Titan sub was intended to dive thousands of meters below the surface. Remember, the Titanic is 3,800 meters down. For my American friends, that's about 12,500 feet. That's important, 3,800 meters. Remember that. The pressure of this depth is so powerful that engineers interviewed by Nexus News said it's roughly equivalent to having the entire weight of the Eiffel Tower sitting right on top of you. That's the kind of pressure we're dealing with, folks. These depths, known as crush depth by some members of the U.S. Navy, have claimed hundreds of submariners' lives, including the infamous tragedy of the USS Thresher. There, a U.S. Navy submarine imploded at a depth of, get this, 730 meters, a mere fraction of the depth the tiny sub aspired to travel. According to Lockridge's complaint, Titan was an unusual vessel. Unlike many other vessels, the Titan used an experimental design. Now, there's a couple of things here. The shape, the size, and the stuff it's made of. Problem one, the Titan sub is a cylindrical design. Most subs used to bring human beings down into those crushing depths are a sphere. And the reason is very simple. A sphere evenly distributes the weight of that giant Eiffel Tower sitting on you. A cylinder does not, not as well at least. So the Titan is made in a cylindrical design, and this was done to have more people aboard because they were trying to make this a profitable commercial enterprise. You need more people, more people buying tickets. The other problem was something that had never been done before, and it scared the absolute shit out of Lockridge. This Titan vessel used an experimental carbon fiber composite for its hull. Now, this is already unusual. Most subs are built from steel or titanium or some other solid metal, and they never mix materials. This is important. Materials are not mixed on these subs. Instead, the Titan used layers and layers of aerospace-grade carbon fiber. Now, it's noted, this has not been proven yet, but it has been alleged that Stockton Rush got this carbon fiber on a discount sale from Boeing, the aerospace engineering company. He got it cheap because its shelf life had expired. Like most things, materials degrade over time, and after a period of time sitting in storage, some companies say it's no longer safe for the intended use. And allegedly, Stockton bought this stuff on discount because it was expired. Now back to the way the sub was built. Each layer of carbon fiber was glued together with a thick peanut butter-like adhesive, and the result was an incredibly lightweight, rigid hull. It was cheaper and easier to work with than the metals would be. Speaking of less expensive construction, though, the electronic system to monitor this stuff is pretty simple. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But first, why is carbon fiber raising so many alarm bells? Carbon fiber is a rigid structure. It has incredible tensile strength. For those who don't know, tensile strength refers to a material's ability to resist being stretched or pulled apart. If you take two ends of a rope and pull, 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 tensile strength is what's keeping you from snapping it. Tensile strength is very important in aerospace engineering 
because of the flexing and twisting forces often exerted on aircraft. Now, if you've gone on YouTube, you might have seen videos of engineers intentionally flapping or flexing a plane's wings up and down, and they're doing that in a lab to test tensile strength. They want to make sure that they can resist being stretched and pulled. But the Titan is not an airplane. When you are diving deep into the ocean, you want a material with high compressive strength. Where tensile strength resists being stretched or pulled apart, materials with high compressive strength resist being squeezed, compressed, or crushed. If your goal is to be in a submersible and not have it cave in all around you, you don't want tensile strength, you want compressive strength. Rob McCallum, David Lockridge, and others had warned Stockton that the carbon fiber hull did not have enough compressive strength to resist the crushing pressure of the deep sea. Stockton ignored them. The Titan's hull was about five inches thick and was constructed of layers of carbon fiber. The carbon fiber cylinder was the passenger compartment, and each side of it was capped by a titanium end. Now, this was another issue that people had warned Stockton about. You're not supposed to be mixing materials when you build these subs. But Stockton was not completely blind to all possible safety measures. He employed a simple electronic safety system called an electronic acoustic monitoring system. The acoustic monitoring system listened for signs of straining, crackling, or breaking on the carbon fiber. Now, Stockton touted this as an innovative design. But whistleblower David Lockledge, his employee, who we're going to know a lot about in just a minute, had serious concerns about this system. Long story short, the failure point of carbon fiber is nearly instant. By the time an acoustic monitor detects crackling in the hull, it's too late. You're fucked. It's over. The crackling of carbon fiber failing under the immense ocean pressure is not a warning. It is a game over sound. By the time you hear this thing going off, your toast. Lockridge and other employees insisted that the sub be subjected to testing to ensure the experimental carbon fiber was safe. When Lockridge spoke up, he was summarily fired. They terminated him. Unwilling to let this experiment go any farther, Lockridge did not take this lying down. He reported the unsafe design to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, also known as OSHA. And if you don't know, this is a government agency in the United States which investigates reports of unsafe conditions. Stockton had said before that he takes safety warnings as a personal insult. And damn it, did he mean that. In retaliation, as if being fired wasn't enough, Stockton and his company filed a lawsuit suing David Lockridge for, get this, misappropriation of trade secrets, breach of contract, and fraud. That's right. When Lockridge reported the safety violations and the concerns he had to OSHA, OceanGate said that he had stolen their trade secrets and committed fraud. In its complaint filed in federal district court in Washington state, OceanGate alleged that when David Lockridge reported the unsafe design, he illegally exposed the company's trade secrets. The lawsuit alleged that OceanGate and its CEO were harmed by Lockridge by revealing their proprietary and innovative design to regulators. Holy gaslight, Batman. Holy gaslight. You reported my unsafe, sketchy-ass design... And now I'm going to sue you for exposing my sketchy ass design. Do you see the logic here? After being fired, the company is now accusing David Lockridge of stealing technical secrets and fraud and breaching his contract. But thank God, this guy, David Lockridge, he has balls of steel. He didn't back off. He lawyered up. So legally, just so you know, he's playing defense in this lawsuit because the company sued David Lockridge first. But his attorneys filed something called a cross complaint. Now, here's something that you need to know for the non lawyers. When you get sued, you can file a cross complaint for damages arising from the same set of facts. And in his cross complaint to the lawsuit, Lockridge alleged, among other things, wrongful termination and whistleblower retaliation. According to Lockridge's complaint, now this is a condensed version because it's a 15 page document. 
Lockridge identified numerous issues that posed safety concerns. This is straight from his legal filings and offered corrective action and recommendations for each. Lockridge primarily expressed concern regarding the lack of non-destructive testing performed on the hull of the Titan. Lockridge was told that no form of equipment to perform such a test existed, and OceanGate instead would rely solely on the acoustic monitoring system that they were going to install in the submersible to detect the start of hull breakdown when the sub was about to fail. This is that real-time monitoring system. It's also called RTM. Remember that. That's what they named the system. So he says this is unsafe. OceanGate is saying, don't worry, we have a super fancy listening device that's going to listen for when the sub is cracking so you know it's about to crack while you're deep underwater. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but that's what they said. Lockridge again expressed concern that this was problematic because this type of acoustic analysis would only show when a component is about to fail, often milliseconds before an implosion, and would not detect any existing flaws prior to putting pressure on the hull. This is what I was just talking about. It's, it's a doomsday alert. It's, there's nothing you can do. By the time this thing is going off, when you hear the RTM alarm, you're done. There's nothing you can do. Lockridge again stressed the potential danger to passengers of the Titan as the submersible reached extreme depths. The constant pressure cycling weakens existing flaws, resulting in large tears of the carbon. Non-destructive testing was critical to detect potentially existing flaws in order to ensure a solid and safe product for the safety of passengers and crew. This is still from the complaint, but already the red flags are flying around like crazy. We're mixing materials. We're using discount bin aerospace carbon fiber that no one else is using. You talk to James Cameron, he does this stuff all the time. He doesn't use this stuff. And he sure as hell doesn't mix materials either. You don't mix carbon fiber with titanium when you're building one of these subs. All the experts are saying it's dangerous. And then on top of that, you've got this acoustic listening system that, that's really not going to do anyone any good. So the company is clearly aware of the danger here, but for reasons that are about to make you scream, they were ignored. Continuing from the complaint filed by David Lockridge's attorneys. Lockridge discovered why he had been denied access to the viewport information from the engineering department. Apparently, he was asking some questions about individual components to see what else was unsafe here. The viewport at the forward end of the submersible was only built to a certified pressure of 1,300 meters, although OceanGate intended to take passengers down to depths of four thousand meters. It is going down almost four times deeper than it's rated for. And for all my blue collar friends out there, including my firefighter friends, here's a little thing about material safety. I remember from my days as a firefighter. Great example is rope rescue. When we go to rescue victims using a rope rescue system, we do not exceed the rated strength of that rope because if it snaps, someone's going to die. Instead, we make sure we're using no more than one ninth one ninth of the rated strength of that rope. And that number is important. We don't go more than one ninth above the strength of the rope because God forbid there's a sudden gust, a sudden strain on the rope, something strikes it that spikes that pressure. And now even though you're under the rated strength, it'll snap. So for this submersible to have a viewport, your freaking window rated to 1300 meters, when you're going down to, to take a look at something 3,800 meters below, that's scary to me. As a former firefighter, that scares the shit out of me. And as an engineer, I'm sure it scares the shit out of the people who watch this. That's not cool. The paying customers, this is back on the complaint, the paying customers would not be aware and would not be informed of this experimental design, the lack of non-destructive testing on the whole, or the hazardous flammable materials being used within the sub. Flammable materials, that's not good. You don't want to fire inside your submarine. Lockridge again expressed concerns regarding the quality control and safety issues relating to the Titan. As outlined in his inspection report and insisted OceanGate perform testing on the experimental hull, Lockridge also strongly encouraged OceanGate utilize a classification agency such as 
the American Bureau of Shipping to inspect and certify the Titan. So basically what Lockridge is doing here is he wants some third party with expertise to take a look at this thing. It's not enough to just have the engineers who built it say, oh, it's good. Wink, wink. We think it's fine. Looks fine. That's not how this goes. He wants an actual professional organization to come in who has no interest in this thing being approved to decide if it's safe or not. I think a more reasonable CEO might have listened to this. But Stockton had a lot of ambition. Rather than address Lockridge's concerns or undergo corrective action, rather than rectifying the issue and ensuring the safety or utilizing a standard classification agency to inspect the Titan, OceanGate did the exact opposite. They immediately fired David Lockridge. OceanGate gave Lockridge approximately 10 minutes to clear out his desk and exit the premises. You think we're unsafe? Here's an internal reverse. Pack your shit and get out. These are the allegations of the cross complaint. They paint a picture of a CEO so hell bent on rushing the no 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 pun intended so hell bent on rushing the sub to commercial profitability that many warnings were ignored. Fortunately for David Lockridge, this case was quietly settled three months later. It is not known, at least to me, I tried to find it. It is not known how much he was paid, if anything. It's not known how much OceanGate was paid, if anything. All I know is that the parties resolved the case. I imagine, I wasn't there, but I imagine Stockton Rush reflected on this whistleblower lawsuit before his final dive. He might have huffed at the glowing list of traitors accusing him of being unsafe. Stockton was insulted, disgusted, and angry at any implication that his precious Titan sub was a death trap. But just to be safe, following the lawsuit, Stockton did take his lawyer's advice. Each and every passenger signed a waiver before embarking. The four-page waiver includes a laundry list of possible fatal accidents which passengers could experience. And to avoid another repeat of 2018, the waiver asked passengers to sign away their rights. It's a big document, but here's two key provisions. I'm reading this from the waiver. When diving below the ocean surface, this vessel will be subjected to extreme pressure, and any failure of the vessel while I am aboard could cause me severe injury, disability, emotional trauma, and other harm and or death. I understand I may decline to participate in any dive below the ocean or any other activity of the expedition at any time. Now, I'm a lawyer. This language sounds scary, but it's really not that unusual for a waiver. I've honestly, I've seen harsher language on laser tag waivers, but here's where it gets scary. Paragraph two. This is the part that I would not sign. I would not sign this shit. I would go home. A portion of the expedition will be conducted inside an experimental submersible vessel that will dive 3,800 meters to the shipwreck of the Titanic. The experimental submersible vessel has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body and is constructed of materials that have not been widely used for manned submersibles. Fucking scary. Uh, At least they were honest. That's all I can say. But returning from our long legal detour, let's revisit Stockton. We're going to leave 2018. We're going to go back to Stockton and his passengers on the morning of June 18th, 2023. On that morning, Stockton probably scoffed to himself. The cowardly experts would not stop him now. The warnings were just naysayers, fools, stubborn, self-important people who did not understand as well as Stockton and his hero, Elon Musk, did. The dive conditions were perfect on that day. And an approaching storm meant Stockton's window to see the Titanic with his own eyes was rapidly closing. With the all clear to embark from the Polar Prince vessel and with fresh ink on his passengers' waivers, Stockton entered the sub and his crew locked the end caps tight. The Titan was heaved into the sea and after a final system check, it began its descent. What follows is the unverified transcript. I'm going to walk you through everything that happened from the moment that sub hit the water until its end. I will read this to you in full quotes, 
with my assessment as to what is happening and why personally I believe the transcript is authentic. I tend to look at things online with a lot of suspicion. And I looked at what clues would be here to tell me this is a bullshit transcript. And maybe it is, but I don't think so. I think it's real. And I'm going to explain why. First transmission, 7.52 a.m. Polar Prince, that's the surface vessel that launches the sub. Clear for descent. Enjoy the ride. Titan, descending now. Titan, launch sequence complete. Ready? Polar Prince, all clear. Titan, proceeding. Polar Prince, enjoy the dive, gentlemen. Polar Prince, you're 15 minutes into the dive. Current depth, system check, please. Titan at 8.21 a.m. System check complete. All in order. All lights are green. We are 756 proceeding. Polar Prince, thank you. Proceed. 756, from what I gather researching this, means they are 756 meters below the surface. Later, an engineer named Jeff Ostroff, who you should definitely check out his YouTube. He's a very knowledgeable guy. He assessed this transcript. And in his video, he said, we're only 20 minutes into this dive, yet we've reached a depth very close to where the USS Thresher imploded decades earlier. Ostroff speculates that the sub is traveling too fast. The reason I believe this is a real transcript is because although the sub is ahead of schedule, this is still a perfectly plausible speed. And I think a fake transcript would have some glaring errors in the timestamps. I think the experts looking at this would say, this is impossible. It would have imploded. It doesn't have the ballast for this. They would have said something, but I think the speed makes sense. But note, they are going down too fast. Back to the transcript. 8.34 a.m. Polar Prince. 30 minutes in. Update, please. Titan. All systems are functioning normally. We're in good shape. Continuing our descent as planned. Polar Prince. Superb. Proceed. 8.49 a.m. Polar Prince. Over 45 minute mark. Current depth. Confirm status. 8.51 a.m. Titan. Depth 19.34. All systems stable and descent continuing as planned. Happy crew. 852, Polar Prince. Excellent. Again, engineer Jeff Ostroff noted the sub is descending too fast, and this matters for two reasons. First, the steady accumulation of pressure on the hull is spiking as the ship descends. The sudden increased pressure exerts more strain on the material than a slower descent. Second, as Ostroff speculated in his videos, the lack of alarm from Polar Prince indicates a sort of complacency here. The sub is going down too fast and Polar Prince isn't raising any alarms here. When an organization becomes so accustomed to rule breaking, even clear warning signs like a rapid descent get ignored. Back to the transcript. This is about nine minutes later. 9.01 a.m. Polar Prince. You're at the hour mark. 9.02 a.m. Titan. All is smooth sailing here. 9.15. Polar Prince. You are at 75 minutes. Depth? Status? Do you need to adjust velocity? I think at this point, Polar Prince is noticing they're going too fast, and I think they're starting to get a little uncomfortable. 9.17 a.m. Titan. All under control. At 2.960. That's 2,960 meters. No adjustments needed. We're enjoying the ride. 9.19 a.m. Polar Prince. Understood. <sighs> Brace yourself, folks. This is where shit starts to get really scary. It's going to fall apart really fast. This is everyone's final warning, if you're listening, to switch to another episode if you think this might be triggering to you. At 9.28 a.m., the first... Oh my god, this is scary. At 9.28 a.m., the first undeniable warning that the sub is in trouble happens. 9.28 a.m. Titan to Polar Prince. We're noting an alarm from the RTM. This is fucking scary. RTM is short for real-time whole health monitoring. This is the acoustic warning system we talked about earlier. Remember, that's the one that listens for the imperceptible crackles or breaks in the carbon fiber hull. This is the system that David Lockridge warned about in his lawsuit. He warned it would be too late if this alarm ever went off, and now Titan's reporting an alarm. Holy fucking shit, this scares me so much. This is scary. 
9.28 a.m. This is only 20 seconds after the transmission. Titan to Toller Prince, reducing velocity, descent depth, 3433. They are just a few hundred meters from the Titanic at this point. Now, the ocean is pure black, and even with floodlights, they probably can't see it at this depth, but they are very, very deep. They're more than four times deeper than Thresher was when it was crushed. Returning to the transcript now. 928, Polar Prince to Titan. Understood. Do you need to ascend? 930, Titan. No change with thrust. The rate of descent is increasing. At 35, going to release ballast now. Stand by. Polar Prince, yes, agree. Release the ballast. Okay, so at this point, even though they are so close to the Titanic, if they were on the surface, they'd be able to see it. They are so close. Stockton is probably getting a little itchy down there. I think he's starting to be scared. He's trying to thrust his engines and go back, but they're still sinking. He can't stop the descent. He's releasing his ballast. That means he's trying to get rid of extra weight so they can start climbing. Things are bad if he's bailing now. He's this close. He's trying to thrust up. His engines aren't working. He's trying to release weight. He's still going down. Titan, no improvement. Preparing to jettison the frame. This is a device that's around the sub. It carries some extra weight, and sometimes they jettison it to help get them up. Polar Prince, affirmative. Update when able. RTM, indicator status. 9.35 a.m. Titan, frame jettisoned, multiple attempts needed. Took him a couple tries to get that thing off. But starting the ascent now. 9.36 a.m. Polar Prince, multiple attempts. What is your status? RTM indicators? Depth? This would not be the first time the frame got stuck. Polar Prince is concerned, but it's still not clear how serious the situation is. That's why they're kind of peppering him with questions here. And Titan is silent for a whole minute. Then Polar Prince checks in again. 9.37 a.m. Polar Prince. Update, please, when able. Polar Prince. One minute later. Can you identify source? RTM indicator status? 9.40 a.m. Titan. Neg. That's short for negative. So what's happening here is this is my hands are sweating. This is scary. What's happening here is the acoustic monitor, the one that listens, it's picking up some kind of crackling in the carbon fiber. It's picking up breaking sounds. It's causing an alarm. Now, multiple RTM indicators, they've got a bunch of them all over the hull. They're designed to, in theory at least, pinpoint where the crackling is coming from. Now, again, I don't know what the crew is supposed to do. If that thing goes on, you can't exactly like stick your finger in a leak. You can't duct tape a crack on this thing. Um, but still, the Polar Prince wants to know the source. I don't, I don't know what they hope they can do here. 9.40 a.m., Polar Prince, 30 seconds later. RTM status. 9.42, Titan, trying to run diagnostics. Ascending now, but very slow. Sounds have subsided. Global RTM alert active, all red. So the acoustic monitors are going off all over the hull. Apparently, the crew could actually hear some noise initially. I think that's what they mean by saying sound subsided. They could hear something, but it's gone away. And even though the alarms are still going off, uh, you know, they're, it doesn't mean they're out of the woods. Just because you don't hear it doesn't mean it's not cracking. That's why they have the sensors there. Ascent is happening, but again, it's very slow, meaning that even as they are creeping up, this sub is still being squeezed and crushed by the pressure of the ocean. 9.42 a.m., Polar Prince, understood. Any codes, depth, ascent rate? 9.43 a.m., Polar Prince, updates when able, please. Titan, slow ascent in progress, quarter predicted, unclear why rate is small, no indicator. At 3476, aiming for the surface. They are deep. This is bad. This is bad. At this point, I am sure Stockton is panicking. His passengers are probably not calm right now. And he's desperately trying to get Titan back to the surface. He's probably feeling a tingle. He's probably haunted by a memory. I wonder if the email from Rob McCalum came back to him at this time. That in his rush to commercialize these voyages, Stockton would be doomed to suffer the same fate as the Titanic, ironically, at the site of the Titanic. 
There is only one final transmission from Titan after this. 9.44 a.m. Polar Prince. We are talking it over with the engineer. Stand by. 9.45 a.m. Polar Prince. Depth and status, please. What's the wattage on upwards thrust? Titan. Reading red on A power bus. I switch to B. At 3475 meters. More sounds aft. 9.47 a.m. Polar Prince. Understood. Continue ascent. Talking to Carlos about power bus situation now. Stand by. 9.48 Polar Prince. We are activating recovery procedures. Carlos is requesting wattage output from bus B. Status update, please. Velocity of ascent. 950 Polar Prince. We're not receiving you. Update, please. 951 Polar Prince. Status and depth report. 953 Polar Prince. We need you to respond with status and depth. Carlos is requesting wattage update on thrusters. 955 Polar Prince. We are unable to read you. We are moving to recovery coordinates. Report if you read. 957 Polar Prince. Please respond if you're able. Holy shit, that is heavy. If it was hard to listen to, believe me, that was hard to read. The Titan would not be seen again until its wreckage was recovered, scattered across the seafloor near the Titanic. Fucking chills, man. Chills. I can't even... Like, how scary is this? I've put myself there in my imagination, particularly Stockton Rush. I can't stop thinking about this. I, I wonder if there was a point before the implosion that Stockton realized, this is it. This time is different. To be clear, the problems on dives were not uncommon. On one prior dive, his vessel lost contact with the surface for four hours. On another, his thrusters malfunctioned and caused the sub to spin uncontrollably in circles. And on yet another voyage, perhaps the first time Stockton probably felt genuinely freaked out, the sub's ballast malfunctioned, leaving them trapped on the ocean floor for about 24 hours. And on that dive, allegedly, the sub had to wait for the ballast to naturally fall off due to corrosion. So as his sub's acoustic warning indicators first alerted, I think Stockton was probably playing the peacekeeper in that tiny little vessel. He'd seen this before. Something always goes wrong during a dive. Everyone should stay calm. But this time he was wrong. At some point, the sub caved in all around him, claiming his life and the life of his passengers. What's maddening about the whole situation is the many, many warning signs. The brave whistleblowers who predicted the disaster with terrifying accuracy. The lawsuits. The, the, just so many people trying to say this wasn't going to be safe. Hindsight reveals the employees who came forward to be almost prophetic. Now, even though the company ignored them, I think even here's what I think. I think Robin McCallum and David Lockridge deserve a lot of credit here. I, I wonder if they struggle with a little bit of guilt because their warnings went unheeded, but what else are you supposed to do? Filing a complaint with OSHA is protected by state and federal law. Firing an employee and initiating a bogus lawsuit to silence them is retaliation, and that's generally going to be illegal. What Lockridge did was totally gutsy and badass. When he got served with the lawsuit, he didn't panic. He lawyered up. He filed a cross complaint. Part of me wishes this case went to trial, this 2018 lawsuit between Lockridge and Oceangate. I kind of wish it went to trial. Maybe the outcome would have been different. I have no way of predicting that. But if you take any one thing from this episode, it's this. We cannot control what our employers are going to do. We can't control the greed, the hubris, the arrogance of other people, but we do have the power to speak up. And I'm. I live in the real world. Here, it didn't have the result we would have wanted. They spoke up and people still got hurt. Failures happen. That's real life. Just because they did the right thing and it didn't give us the result we wanted does not mean you shouldn't speak up when you see trouble. You should absolutely speak up when you see trouble because your odds of fixing it are a lot higher if you speak up than if you stay quiet. But should Lockridge or McCallum have done anything different? Could they have... I think ultimately they did the best they could. And Stockton Rush was just determined to go down there. Uh, he he wanted to be an innovator. He wanted to be an explorer. I think he would have gone down there in a recycled soda can if he could. Like, he just wanted to go explore. And ultimately, the man was fixed on a dream. 
And based on the news reports, the emails, the court the court filings, the, the transcript, it seems to me nothing was going to stop him. This is what he wanted. He wanted to explore. And one final note, I get I, I, I get the Stockton Rush guy. I, I see this kind of person a lot. I get a lot of pushback on my content. I get a lot of pushback from people saying my content hurts businesses. It hurts innovation. I'm told that labor laws, anti-retaliation statutes, and safety regulations are somehow crippling U.S. businesses. I've been told that these rules that are all meant to keep people safe, stifle innovation, and hurt America. I mention this because what more proof do you need that basic regulations save lives? This isn't communism. This isn't socialism. This isn't a dictatorship. It's adherence to a basic code. Just as the submersible community developed engineering standards to keep explorers safe. Mind you, no submersible has ever imploded until this one. This is the first time it's happened. These codes exist. Whistleblower laws exist. Labor laws exist to protect employees. Now, I get it. Not all rules are good rules, but a good rule can literally save your life. Folks, this has been another episode of Working Class with Attorney Ryan, probably the most stressful episode I've done so far. I am sweating. So if, if you're like me and this stressed you out, get up. Drink some water, take a mental health walk, enjoy the sunshine. But before you do, please remember to like and subscribe, maybe share it with a friend who's interested in this case, or check out one of my other episodes. Thank you, and I'll see you on the next one.